Welcome to Safe, Efficient, Profitable, a Worker Safety Podcast, where we break down real problems from real situations and discuss realistic solutions. And here's your host, owner of Allen Safety LLC and CHMM, Joe Allen. Good day. This is Joe. Welcome back for those of you who have been listening to the other episodes and for you that are new. Welcome. Today we're talking about confined space. A little bit different than last time. This is episode 13. The last confined space we talked about was episode 12 was about evaluation and assessments and programs and kind of thinking about all the hazards in the list and how you're going to manage it. This particular podcast is about when you need training, do we go in, do we not, what do we call entry, entry rescue, non-entry, pick and rescue, all that kind of stuff. After you decide the assessments, you decide what you need, and now you've got to go do it. So thank you again for joining us this week. I'm going to get right into it here. People know that we do a lot of confined space, and for those you don't know, you can check out our website. But We spend a lot of our year writing procedures and doing training and working with different events that have happened over the year. And for the longest time can I remember, I'm 52 now, I started dealing with confined spaces around 20 years old, and then now I've got to be a trainer for the last 22 years. So we've got a little bit different way we may think about things, so just stay open-minded as we go through this. All right, so the first thing is training is uh, when do we need it? Well, that question is all based on which spaces you're deciding you're going to go into, what your hazard says, and the way you're going to bait those hazards on your assessments. And then you'll determine, okay, so I've got this space I'm going to go into, space A. And space A says I can do everything from a tripod and winch on the outside. Okay, well then what we train on is the meters, the permits, the assessment, the tripod, the winch, the PPE, stuff like that. Now, if you say, okay, this particular space is a vessel or a tank, and I've got to climb into it and go in horizontal. Okay, well, now you may need different kinds of equipment, same meter, but maybe a different length of hose, or maybe a different access point, or maybe the amount of people may change. So as you figure this out with the different spaces, it may change not only the amount of people you're going to train, skills you're going to train them on, and also the amount of time. So sometimes you have a training, say it's just somebody who's going to be reviewing a permit. They may only go to two to three hours of training. They're just trying to review a permit. If they're going to perform as an entry tenant or supervisor, that may be four hours or more. And if they decide they're going to be some type of entry and entry rescue, that could be six hours or eight hours or two days. Now, everybody has a different version of how they teach this and everybody has pros and cons because some are these third parties, some use internal. It doesn't matter to me which way you do it. All the goal is is to get your people trained at the skills that you think they need to do the task you expect them to perform. And that's it. So if you expect Joe to go into vessel A and do five skill sets, then you train Joe in those five skill sets. And if Joe's not going into vessel B, then all I've got to be trained on is really mainly A and how to deal with that. Now, if A, B, C, and D are all different styles and all different kinds, and I'm going to be trained like in a rescue mode, well, then I may need some more training to see I'm going to handle that. So you break down the training based on what you expect that individual to perform their task and what is reasonable. We have a lot of people say they don't go in. I'm going to ask you politely to go back and look at your list and look at your evaluations and really break down if that's true. I see so many people that say that their company or they do not go in, but I see them reach into vessels or put their head into vessels or put half their body into it. And their version of not going is their feet has not left the ground. I've also seen different interpretations of, well, this part of it has a guard or this part of it does not. So I don't have to fill it out for this part of permit or I don't have to fill it out for this because we don't really go in. I look at it like you have to evaluate what is going in there. Now, there's all kinds of people will tell you this is an absolute, this is absolute, this is not the podcast of that. This is a podcast to say, think about what you call don't go in. Think about what you are going into and think about where your body is when you're breaking that plane or going into it so i treat it a lot like lockout tag out if you break the plane you should have filled out some documentation or should have had some kind of plan and i bring that up because no one sticks one finger in there they end up sticking their arms and hands and their head in the space and it just it just doesn't stop where their body goes i've seen people where half their bodies leaned into a a vessel or tank and you're just like do you have your meter do you have your stuff well i'm not really going in yet 
So please, the courtesy, just take a minute and decide what that really is. Entry only. Um, there's a lot of people, what they'll do is they will go into a vessel, but they only enter these two spaces and nothing else, but they actually go into other things. Or they'll say, well, we enter this space, but because we do it every day, it's not really a hazard or it's not really a permit required. But if that particular space was the same space and we only entered it once a year, some places would call it permit required. And that's why I go back to the other episode. It can't be based on the amount of times you go into a space if it's a hazard. If it's a hazard, it's a hazard. And until you manage that hazard or remove that hazard, it's still there. So for example, a fall. If I have a fall hazard and I have to have a tripod and winch to go in and out of there, I can't reclassify in that moment that I've eliminated the hazard because the hazard's still there. You're just controlling it by having me wear a harness and hooked up to a winch system. So I spend time with locations working on what they call entry and what they call the hazard and then how often they go in is one of the questions I ask because it'll be interesting to see that the amount of time some people go into a space will somehow determine that the hazards don't exist no more. Now, I'm not saying you can't reclassify. I'm not saying there's not methods and systems you can use by taking media readings or document or a certain amount of time. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a space that has pretty significant hazards, like a boiler or a pit. And just because we go into it multiple times, we say it's not as hazardous. It is still. The next one is, is training. When do I need to train rescue? Well, I've had a lot of locations the last three years say we don't need rescue or we don't need medical or we don't need anything because the fire department will do everything. I've seen the opposite from the fire departments. I've not seen them respond as much as they used to. I've seen more fire departments in the last three years say, yes, we will help you. But when you call, they say we can't either have someone there or cannot block anyone to be available. I've had multiple locations that have tried to get the fire department to come and look at their spaces and they won't do it. And it's all about crewing and time and management. It's nothing against the fire departments. It's just they have a business to run and they have other job tasks to do besides wait at the firehouse to see how your confined space goes. So my view is you have the vessel or the container. You bought it, you shipped it, you installed it, and you hooked it up. My view is you own that particular item. Now you have an employee that you're paying to do a particular task. My deal is... If you have a task, you have to train them. If you expect them to go into confined space, you have to train them. But you also have to have a way for them to get out. If you can't figure out how they're successfully going to get out, whether it be through some kind of third-party service or some kind of training or some kind of fire department, then why are they going in there? They have to be able to get out of the space once they go in if there's a problem, up to include medical like we talked about on the last podcast. So that is the biggest part I look at. If you're going to do that entry, then you have to have a way to take care of me if something goes wrong. So I look at the different types of rescue. I don't look at all rescue the same. A tripod with the winch, winching someone out that takes 15 seconds, completely different rescue than having to go in with SCBAs and pull someone out of a vessel. I don't personally teach high angle rescue. Um, The reason I don't is because I think high angle rescue has to do with outside of a building. I think a confined space is going in a hole. And I have that a lot where people will be at a small location. They have one tank they go into and they're being told they need uh, four and five days of training to go into this one tank to provide rescue. But the tank is 10 foot long and, you know, or maybe it's vertical. And if you just hook someone up to winch, you can winch them out. So you got to look at what training is needed for the job test you're going to do and evaluate that correctly and make sure it's what you really want. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with high angle rescue. It has a purpose and confined space training has a purpose. It's like sometimes confined space rescue doesn't need an SCBA, sometimes it does. Sometimes you need people that have medical training so they can provide help. Sometimes packaging someone inside of a space may be different than if you're just winching someone straight out. So there's other ways you can look at it and you look at all pieces of the puzzle. Non-entry rescue compared to entry rescue. This one is asking me a lot. That's why I'm covering it today. In my world, non-entry rescue means I'm not sticking any part of my body into this space. Now, I will tell you, for example, on a tripod winch system or a davit system, if we winch that person out of the space on a tripod, there's a good chance the attendant who's outside the hole would be a get down on their knees. If the hole is in type of configuration where the 
entrance head can hit the side of it, the attendant has a tendency to get down on their knees, reach in with their hand, and try to move the head out of the way while they're trying to winch. So even though that may be one person assigned to be the attendant, even though it's a 9 to rescue, it ends up placing the attendant's face near the opening and their body inside. It's not to me whether it's the technicality or not. It's about they need help. Give them some help. Have some other people show up to help hold the tripod. Have other people show up that can maybe help do the winch. Or maybe the part of the rescue team is that the attendant stays outside the hole and the rescue team is the one sticking their hand in there. Or the rescue team is wearing a cartridge mask. Or the rescue team is wearing an SCB if they even have to do that task. Or whatever it is. It's just don't leave the person by themselves when reality is, yes, they're supposed to be able to do it themselves, but I've winched a lot of people out of holes and I can't winch them all by myself with the tripod and pull them away the tripod falls or i can't run the winch or i'm almost leaned over the hole too far and over myself falling in i like getting a couple extra people there to help now horizontal when i first came into the industry i was told that about 98 percent of all the horizontal entries were not to rescue and i i've never seen that in my world i've seen that the horizontal entries the hole is about 18 to 25 inches or 30 inches off of the ground and a person climbs into it and then they drop down a few inches and then they go do their task. And I've never seen anyone pulled out of a space like that without people having to reach in or having to go in to get that person. I'm not saying that somebody may not have a way to do it. Well, that's great. But in my lifetime and all the amount of drills, I mean, I do, when we're doing a training class, for example, if we have, say, 15 people in class on a one-day class, we will do multiple entries that day and we will try to do horizontal entries and as we do those horizontal entries each person may end up going through there so in a five days that may be 50 something entries or 60 entries just because it's not everybody or sometimes it's outside or inside or whatever but say you got 50 entries going on well we're in a location every week so you look at the amount of entries that we're doing over there and i just try to do real time what can people really do and really pull someone out with the resources they truly have. And if they don't have that, then we have to come up with a different plan. We write assessments or we write a rescue plan. Write assessments, entry, nine, entry. Fill out a permit, entry, nine, entry, rescue. We're checking those boxes. We're asking those people who's currently trained. I want to have people there that have some training that can help because it seems like when something goes wrong, more than one thing goes wrong, and you want some extra friends to come help you. So that's my deal about the entry and nine entry. I also believe that if you rely on fire departments or outside services, nothing wrong with that. You got to count your time. Uh, my view is, is that everyone should be able to be removed from that space and or medical care within six minutes. And the reason for that is it's about getting the standard of care to them, getting the right resources to them or getting them stabilized. Because I've worked events where people have cut themselves or slipped or fall or had a medical event inside the space. And it, and it doesn't take very long for things to go wrong. So we want to give them a timeline. So when you're basing that and you say, I'm going to use an outside source that's 20 minutes away, I would not say it's acceptable. If I wrote a confined space assessment or a permit, rescue team on site, what does that mean? Does that mean they're going to be next to the hole or completely across the property? Maybe we have to go change the assessment. Maybe we have to change the occurring. That's fine but we should keep doing the process until we're able to manage it correctly. So we gotta test those systems too. So part of your training is testing the systems. Now there is, like I said, a whole bunch of different versions of training. I'm not gonna say any of them are, are pro or con because that's not my role today, but just make sure you're getting the value for what you're paying for and make sure it's what they're expected to do. If you have an employee who's expected to perform rescue on another employee and there's only one or two in the class, it's hard to simulate that function. I'm not about how many people are in the class. I'm about giving them the training for the task you expect them to perform. And if you expect them to perform a task that requires three or four people to do it, then that particular training needs three or four. Now, you could have training and maybe not have as many people there, but you still have to do some kind of drill or function or something to let them work on the skill sets. My other view is anything that comes to training that has to do with physically performing a task, they should be trained on that task. How do I put on a harness? How do I put on an SCBA? How do I run the winch system? How do I do whatever task there decides to be? How? Once you decide that that person is going to be performing that task, it's easy. You got five things you want to do, you train them on those five things. And then you test to make sure those five things work for the space you're going into. So that's the general idea of the training. I love confined spaces. I love the idea of the subject because there's so many different variables and it always keeps you thinking. 
But the other side about it is it's not very forgiving sometimes if you don't do it correctly. So sometimes I've been told that I'm kind of a little overcautious. It's not that I'm overcautious. I'm just trying to look at real time what's really going to happen. And let's be honest with ourselves. All we're talking about at the end of the day at some places is whether we keep someone there for overtime or whether we have to do the project on Saturday is not enough occurring. Well, then we evaluate that. We evaluate how many people to take. And including, if you have to say it takes five to do this entry, then fine, right? Five on there and figure out who the five are going to be and let's move on and keep going. But stay positive. Keep doing a good job out there. Make these confined spaces amazing. Make them great. No one gets hurt. And then we're all good to go. I appreciate you taking time today to listen. If you want, Jen has at the end of this, you know, ways you can get a hold of us. Or if you have questions, that's fine too. I hope these series, especially on the confined spaces, helped you a little bit. And that's all I have for today. Have a good day and thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to Safe, Efficient, Profitable, a worker safety podcast. If you like what you heard here, please take a moment to write us a quick review, like, subscribe, and share our podcast so that others can find us. For questions or to request topics that you'd like to hear on our next show, please visit us at wwwallen safetycom Thank you. Stay safe.